Success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which he has overcome. Booker T. Washington. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Contextual Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host and author, Dr. Matthew Coots, author of the book Contextual Intelligence, How Thinking in 3D Can Help Resolve Complexity, Uncertainty, and Ambiguity. And welcome to episode 14. In today's episode, we're talking about overcoming the obstacles to contextual intelligence. And this is one of my favorite chapters in the book because it provides a very practical and insightful look into specific actions you can take to begin to practice CI and then more specifically identifying those things which hinder you from practicing contextual intelligence. In the last episode, we talked about the specific things that hindered you from thinking in three dimensions of time. That is using and leveraging hindsight, insight, and foresight. And we talked about the conjunction fallacy and hindsight bias and how recognizing and identifying those things prohibit you from practicing the three dimensions of time in your thinking. Well, in this episode, we're going to kind of continue in that same theme and vein, but talk a little bit more about the bigger picture of contextual intelligence. I think it's important that we review really quickly what contextual intelligence is, and we go back to some of the earlier episodes where we define contextual intelligence, and it's important to remember that context actually comes from the Latin word contextier, which means texture, or it's where we get the word and the idea behind textiles and fabrics. And when we talk about the texture of something, it's really the fine grains, the colors, the the threads, the fabrics, the different textures that go in to weave a tapestry. And when we talk about contextual intelligence, it's having the awareness and the alertness to be able to recognize and identify the different aspects, attitudes, behaviors, assumptions, etc., that people kind of tie into their behaviors and their actions. And it's being able to actually look at the finer aspects of what variables and what factors are being sewn together to create the current situation or picture that you're looking at. So context is literally the weaving together of different variables that form a pattern of relationships, just like the threads in a tapestry. Each pattern is its own context and is easily influenced by the addition or subtraction of seemingly insignificant or irrelevant variables. Context is also easily influenced by the subtle overlaps or collisions with other contexts. And to just to comment on that, if you go back and remember all the different spaces that we live in and that we try to operate in. So the most common way to approach that or to think about that is thinking about, well, we have a social life, we have a work life, we have a private life, we have a family life, all these kinds of things. And what really frustrate so many people is when these different lives that we have overlap. And when they overlap, it kind of creates a new situation or a new context. And we often don't recognize which behaviors are more or less appropriate depending on how significant the overlap is, what is the dominant context, things like that. It's like running into a work colleague outside of work during a very important, busy decision-making season. You know, everybody's going to start thinking about, well, why, how did this happen? Was this a coincidence? Are you stalking me? Are you trying to bias me or influence my decision? And we ask all these silly questions when really it's just an innocent overlap of two contexts, but it often causes us to go into this realm, into this space in our heads where we sometimes don't know what to do. And that's really a tragic thing if you think about it, because it, it truly is just an accident. But because of all all the different experiences that we have, all the different stories we've heard, we create these fictional realities that make it difficult for us to make decisions in. 
And somebody who has a high degree of contextual intelligence handles those types of collisions and overlaps very well. And I think it's a really important thing to understand. So there are some specific obstacles that we can prepare for to help us when those kinds of situations present themselves. And one thing is to just understand the whole concept of micro and macro contexts. So micro contexts are smaller and sometimes less obvious contexts or situations within the larger mega contexts. Mega contexts are, of course, large scale and are often but not always the markers of context that we identified in chapter one, episode two, where we talked about politics, family, religion, and things like that. Micro contexts fit within those. An example would be within a mega context of family, there are micro contexts of different roles. So in my case, it'd be dad, husband, provider, protector, etc. So I've got the macro context of family and the micro context of my individual roles. And what can be confusing sometimes, and I often joke about this in my workshops and seminars, is how these micro contexts sometimes overlap and collide together and affect the larger context. Uh, For example, my roles or my micro context as dad and husband. And sometimes those overlap. An example would be when I'm playing with my sons. For example, I have older adult sons now, but when they were younger, and dad would come home from work and and I would, you know, interact with the kids. And in my case, like I said, two sons, uh, we would wrestle and play around and do, you know, do dad stuff with their with their kids, boys, you know, rough house and wrestle around and and things like that. And what I always found really interesting about that is me doing dad things and my wife, who I might not even have been aware she was paying attention or watching, actually thought that that made me a better husband. I was getting husband credit for doing dad things. And that's just, it's just a kind of a little silly example. But we have a lot of situations like that where we have these different contexts and we think that, well, what I need to do in this context to be successful are these three things. And we do these three things and we find that they influence other aspects that we're not even aware that they're influencing. And in order to understand that reality, we've got to begin to think about things as micro and macro context. And when we do that, we can actually start to have influence and understand influence and understand the nature of relationships and the interaction between relationships when we start thinking in those terms. The micro contexts in our lives seems to subtly overlap. The mega contexts in our lives seem to violently collide. It work in politics, for example, religion and the society, you know, things like that. Those are more mega or macro contexts. And what's interesting is when macro contexts collide, they create a violent reaction or a, or a dramatic, maybe not violent, but a dramatic reaction. And sometimes we seem surprised by that. And I think when we're surprised by that, it's because we didn't recognize, oh, this is a mega context or a macro context. So that's one of the things that we need to begin to talk about right away is understanding how micro and macro contexts collide together, fit together, relate to one another, and revolve around each other and understand that everywhere we go and everything we do, there's like a constellation of or orbiting of these micro and macro contexts or mega contexts. And they're always revolving around each other, orbiting each other, moving back and forth, kind of like, you know, you would think about in terms of physics when you got electrons bouncing off of each other and different things like that, creating different interactions. And that's really what's going on here. And that's how dynamic context is. And one of the things that contextually intelligent people do maybe better than some other people is they understand how many different contexts, both macro and micro, that are orbiting around a situation, a person, an event, or a memory, whatever it might be. And they're always watching to see how the interactions and how the overlaps and how the collisions 
are affecting and creating different environments and attitudes. So that's one thing we need to be very, very specific on and, and conscious of. When it comes to specific hindrances, I've identified four that I think are very meaningful. The first one is the pace of change. The second one is the contextual complexity. The third are learned behaviors. And the fourth is an incomplete time orientation. And when we understand each of these four major hindrances to CI, we can begin to appreciate and kind of even predict and predetermine some of the important actions and attitudes that we need to be able to take. The first big obstacle that I identified is the pace of change. So what I mean by that is it's one thing to understand things change and things change often. I, I suppose the, the good news is everybody kind of knows that and, and recognizes that things are changing and things change often. The bad news is you're still behind the eight ball because things change way more often than you think they will. And they change more dramatically than you think they will, or kind of following with chaos theory, the things that you think are small, minor changes end up having a much greater impact than you ever thought they might. And likewise, things that you consider to be major or dramatic changes might have very little impact. So that's what the pace of change is all about. It's just misunderstanding this whole thing of change. Change is difficult enough, but to add to it the speed at which it comes at you is a whole nother thing. The fast pace of change can make it nearly impossible to keep up. Once the need for change has been recognized, however, and a solution implemented, it's time to change again, which is the other frustrating thing about change. One way we can combat the pace of change, and I mentioned this in the chapter, is start practicing what I'm calling improvisational wisdom. Now, improvisational wisdom is not my term. I've heard it other places, so I, but I really love the concept and the context behind the term improvisational wisdom because it's a, it's a neat play on words. Wisdom implies accumulation of experience and, and time spent longevity in a thing. But then improv, of course, is the exact opposite of that. So improvisational wisdom involves intentionally extracting life's lessons from every encounter that you have. In other words, we can learn many lessons from a single situation and then apply those lessons wherever and whenever possible. One of the ways we can leverage this type of wisdom is by understanding that what I've learned in this particular context, in this particular space, may apply to more than the context in which it was learned. In other words, I can take things that I've learned in one context, move over to a completely different, sometimes even entirely unrelated context, and apply the same lesson over there and get a benefit from it. So that's what improvisational wisdom is. And, and that just shows that we can accelerate the practice of wisdom when we begin to realize that I've learned things, I've accumulated insights and wisdom through the course of time that don't just apply here, but also there. And being able to see that and recognize that I can use this lesson I learned learned over here when I was a kid or in this completely unrelated role that I'm in and apply it in this completely different role or apply it 20 or 30 years later, all of a sudden I'm moving ahead on this wisdom curve. And that's the benefit of improvisational wisdom. The second real hindrance or obstacle to contextual intelligence is the level of complexity. So not only do we not understand change all the way, it's also true with complexity. And we've talked about this in previous episodes, but the danger of complexity is that things are more complex than we realize they are. Again, no one really has a problem with saying things are complex, but what they have a problem with is understanding how complex they actually are. And what we're realizing is that things are, in fact, way more complex than we even realize. And another big part of that is understanding that things that we are calling complicated aren't 
in fact complicated they are in fact complex and when we mix up those two concepts calling things that are complex complicated it really messes up our problem solving and it really messes up how accurately we see what it is we're looking at and i think we have a default to call things complicated and we fail to recognize how complex things actually are so this leads us to what I recognize and call the complexity paradox. The complexity paradox is this. It's things that are more complex actually require less data, less input to solve. Now, see, that's the exact opposite with complication. The more complicated things are, the more pieces of the puzzle you need. Well, that's not true in a complex system. The more complex things are, the fewer pieces you need. And that kind of sounds crazy to talk about because we talk, because one of the things that we talk about with contextual intelligence is identifying the variables that affect a particular outcome or affect a situation. And we recognize that because of the complex nature of the systems in which we operate, there's always one more variable to consider. And while that's true, there is this law of diminishing return, so to speak, and that at some point, more data, more pieces to the puzzle, more information doesn't help and doesn't change what it is that needs to be done. And a lot of times people who drag their feet on making decisions are actually stalling and or are misunderstanding the nature of the problem they're trying to solve. Most of the time they're stalling and wanting more data because they think they're facing a complicated problem when in fact they're facing a complex problem. As a complex problem, you don't necessarily need more data. You need a wider perspective and a wider angle lens. The tendency for human beings in complicated problems is to focus in, to become myopic, to zero in on a particular variable, on a particular problem. It's what we do when we're doing research, right? It's the whole, whole thing behind the scientific method. We want to tunnel down into a specific area and try to find the culprit or find, find the situation or variable that needs to be blamed or fixed. That's what we do in a complicated problem. And that's our natural human reaction. The reality is things are more complex. And as a complex system, the danger is focusing in, tunneling down, becoming myopic. When we're facing complex problems, we actually want to back up and take in a wider purview. So that's one of the major hindrances to handling complex situations and practicing contextual intelligence is the tendency for us as humans to want to call it complicated and then to tunnel in and focus in on and identify a particular variable that we can manipulate. The third, and I've identified several here, um, four or five of them. I'm only going to talk about one more. The rest you can just read in the chapter. It's a really interesting chapter. The third big obstacle to contextual intelligence is our own experience, our learned behavior. But I say it this way, that practice of contextual intelligence requires that we understand the things that we've learned and how we've learned them. And I've talked about this in other episodes, and that's being able to be meta you know, the metacognition piece of knowing how you're thinking while you're thinking, being aware of your thought processes, being aware of your own heuristics, being aware of the rules of thumb that you live by is really, really important. So we need to really focus on understanding how our own experience biases what we see. As humans, we're often strongly biased by our existing knowledge. And this is something different even than confirmation bias that we talked about previously. Confirmation bias is one thing. That's the tendency to reaffirm what we already know, to seek and to find things that support the ideas that we already hold and gravitate towards people who think like we think. So that's one thing. But then we're also biased by our, ex our own existing knowledge. In other words, we want to make use of our blood, sweat, and tears. And because of that, when we see something, we try to force it into fitting our existing paradigm and our worldview. And that can actually limit dramatically the options that we see 
as being viable to solve a particular problem. So our own learned experience is a major, major issue with that. So the one way to overcome that is to learn how to reframe our experiences. And this is where 3D thinking comes in, specifically the concept of synchronicity and hindsight and how important it is that we understand we need other people to help us reconstruct or remember, as in, you know, I use remember as a kind of a play on words as the opposite of dismember. So kind of remember or put back together our memories correctly the way they actually happened instead of how we remember them, because we always remember our memories inaccurately. And that's really important to understand. That's one of those other things that contextually intelligent people just understand and just know. They give themselves permission to be wrong about what they think they remember. That's a huge mark of a maturity, but it's also a big part of becoming contextually intelligent. And one of the things that they do to combat this bias and our experiences being things that hinder us is understanding that I need to reframe, re-image, remember how we experience certain things. And that's really, really important. So in the rest of the chapter, we talk about time-based myths. We talk about inaccurate time orientation and overemphasizing one time orientation over another. For example, hindsight over foresight and things like that. And there's other a few other things in this chapter that are helpful for you when it comes to practicing contextual intelligence and identifying those things that keep you from being contextual intelligent. So I'd love to get this book in your hands. This chapter and many of the other uh, chapters in this book can offer a lot of insight for you, a lot of development in terms of your leadership, in terms of your performance, in terms of just how well you handle the turbulence of life. So it has a lot of meaningful stuff for you. I hope you, you can get your hands on it. If you need any help from me. I'd love to be in contact with you. So I'll put my information in the show notes. I want to get this book in your hands. In the meantime, hope you have a great day and let me know how I can help you. Have a great one.